Welcome to a comprehensive overview of functions. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of the topics you saw in Algebra 1 and in Algebra 2, starting with what makes a function. So here are a whole bunch of examples with functions that you've seen before. Maybe you remember that in order to determine whether something is a function, all you got to do is take a vertical line and move along the function. And as long as that function only has only touches one point on the vertical line at a time, then something is a function. That's the very basic visualization. It's called the vertical line test. And so at each x value, so if you see here on the quadratic, for each x value at x equals 1, it, there is one corresponding y value. So for each x value, there's exactly one corresponding y value. So if you're following along on your worksheet, a function is a correspondence between two sets where each element in the first set of x values is called the domain, and it corresponds to exactly one element in the second set, uh, our y values, which is called the range. So a function here is an input and output situation. We input an x value and we get an output of a y value. So when calculating the domain of a function, there are primarily two constraints to consider. Hopefully this is review. We first have to examine what makes the denominator of a function equal to zero. The denominator of a function can never equal zero. I use the expression thou shalt not divide by zero. So Dividing by zero is undefined, or you could even consider it as an infinite possibilities, but you you're, cannot divide by zero. So we have to make sure if a function has a denominator, we exclude any values that would make that denominator equal to zero. Then the other scenario we are going to look at is if there is an even root or an even radical, the equation under the root sign must be greater than or equal to zero. It is okay to take the square root of zero. The square root of zero is just zero. The even root of a negative number is imaginary. And so as long as we're working in just the real number system, and analyzing domain in a real number system, then any value under an even root or radical needs to stay greater than or equal to zero. There is a third scenario in logarithms, but we'll get to that in a later unit. We're not gonna deal with that right now. So let's look at some examples. If we are considering these two rules and we have our first example A of a function that is equal to one over X minus three, and we know that the denominator can never be equal to zero, then I know three has to be excluded from my domain. Therefore, the domain of the function of f is all real numbers except three. We're gonna be using interval notation, and that's how I'm gonna write it. So I'm gonna use parentheses, around negative infinity, around and positive infinity, and then I'm also going to use a parentheses around three. The parentheses saying is that I can't capture three in the domain. It's all real numbers except taking a break at three on the number line. Example B has function g of x equals the square root of x plus four. So the function is under an even root, so this x plus 4 value has to be greater than or equal to 0. So even roots of negative numbers are imaginary. Therefore, the domain of g of x must exclude any number that is less than negative 4. Since the value under that square root has to stay 0 or positive, I'm going to start my domain at negative 4. Negative 4 works because if I substitute negative 4 into this function, then I end up with the square root of 0, which is just 0. Okay, but if I would pick a number, if I think about a number line, 
okay, number line extending in both direction. And then I have, if I put negative 4 on my number line, okay, so I have negative 4 on my number line. Anything above negative 4, including negative 4, will work in this equation. Let's think about 0. I know that 0 is a number above negative 4. So if I plug 0 into this g of x function, so if I take g of 0 and plug it into this function, I'm going to get the square root of 0 plus 4, which is just the square root of 4, which I know to be 2. But let's try a number that's left of negative 4 on the number line. So let's try plugging in negative 5. So if I look at g of negative 5, that's going to be equal to the square root of negative 5 plus 4, which is the square root of negative 1, which we all know to be the imaginary unit i, which is not in the real number system. So that's why our domain is going to start at negative 4 and go up to positive infinity. We can see that on the number line, starting at negative 4 up to positive infinity. Pay close attention to your brackets here. I have a bracket around negative 4. That's because it is included in the domain. I have a parentheses around infinity because you can't actually capture infinity. So why don't you try these? Go ahead and pause the video right now and analyze what you believe the domain would be and then try to write your domain in interval notation. Pause the video before, before you look at the answers. Did you pause it? All right, well, welcome back. Here are the answers to these two problems, A and B. If you have questions, make sure you talk to your teacher about why you're not getting these answers. Let's talk about domain with function operations. So if you are adding and subtracting or multiplying functions, so in the examples up here, f and g are being added, subtracted, and multiplied, you're just going to combine the domains of the functions for every op operation except for division. Well, why except for division? Because when we divide functions, one of our functions is now in the denominator. So now we have to also exclude any value that would make that denominator equal to zero, which is something we just talked about. So let's try a couple of examples here. We're going to evaluate f at negative 3 plus g plus h at 2. So what does this look like? So f of negative 3, when I substitute negative 3 into the f function, I end up with 37. If I keep, sorry, if I keep clicking here and I substitute 2 into the g function and 2 into the h function, I end up with 8 once I substitute all those values in and evaluate. So that means if I'm adding these two together, 37 plus 8 is going to equal 45. And that's our final answer to this expression. We get 37 plus 8, which is a sum of 45. In B, we're going to evaluate F divided by G at a value of 2. So I'm going to substitute 2 into the f function. I'm going to substitute 2 into the g function and evaluate. I end up with 32 over 1, which is just 32. Then I'm going to take 3x minus 8. Notice I am going to have a variable and sub that, substitute that into the h function. So look at the h function. It's 4x minus 1. 
So instead of writing x, I'm substituting in this 3x minus 8. So I have 4 times 3x minus 8 minus 1. You got to do a little bit of computation here and you end up with 12x minus 33. Combine that with the 32 and you get a final answer of 12x minus 1 when you put it all together. One last problem, we are going to add f and h together with an input value of x minus 2. So f at x minus 2, this is a quadratic, so I'm going to have to work with that, plus h times x minus 2. With my quadratic, when I'm squaring x minus 2, I have to do x minus 2 times x minus 2. I will have to distribute that binomial. Be very careful. When I do x minus 2 squared, I end up with the quantity x squared minus 4x plus 4. I am squaring the binomial. And then I distribute 4 to the x minus 2, and I end up with 4x minus 8. I have some simplifying I can do in order to combine all my constants together, and I end up with x squared plus 23. So when I simplify this entire expression, I end up with x squared plus 23. In closing, I want you to try these, these last three problems, doing the exact same thing we just did in example one. Now it's up to you to see what you've learned and try to apply it. Thank you for listening.